afternoon and welcome to a deep dive into controller area networks with Qt. Here you see uh, the home screen of a sugar beet harvester. You could watch that in the field uh, this autumn for the first time, actually. So it's a real life example. And the home screen receives roughly 50 CAN frames per second and has to display the information from these CAN frames uh, on the home screen, either numerically or graphically. So every, every number, oh, that's why I have a pointer, every number you see here on the home screen is extracted from a CAN frame. And even the axle positions of the harvester schematic here, they're also extracted from uh, CAN frames. Which come from, so the, the CAN frames come from other electronic control units. So you have a, the harvester has a terminal, obviously, which is one control unit, and it has what, 15, 20 uh, ECUs, electronic control units. So um, CAN frames come in two uh, varieties peer-to-peer uh, -peer messages and uh, broadcast messages. What you see here on the left-hand side, that's the peer-to-peer -peer variety. You use peer-to-peer -peer messages to write or read properties on remote ECUs, so on other ECUs than the one you are on. Um, you actually have, in this system, on this harvester, you have something like 1,800 properties you can set on different other ECUs. Um, the other variety of CAN messages are broadcast messages. So some of the 20, 25 ECUs sends messages to the terminal, and you have to interpret that. So a good example here is the, say, the vehicle speed or engine speed up here, or the total harvested area, or all these informa this information about uh, diesel consumption. And that's actually the signals come in regularly. So the vehicle speed, for, for example, comes in 10 to 20 times a second. If you look at other signals, so you have 350 signals coming from here from five uh, electronic control units, 350. And nearly 10 of them come with a, a rate of 50 to 100 times per second. That's faster than your refresh rate of your, uh, of your display. Then there are some, some others, they're a bit slower, they come at 10 to 20 times, the bulk comes at 2 to 5 times per second. And if you sum that up, you would come to something like 2,700 CAN frames per second, which your terminal must somehow handle. Well, fortunately, that's a bit of a theoretical number because they don't come uh, all at the same time. They may be switched off for some time, like diagnostic messages or so. And so in reality, you see something like 1,100 uh, CAN messages per second rushing into your terminal. And peak, you might see something like 1,700, and that's still too much. So one task of a, of a CAN middleware on, on an HMI terminal is to, uh, to reduce the number of messages which reach the HMI. You do not want 1,100 messages hitting your HMI. The, well, the result will be your HMI will start stuttering or just freeze. That's too much. And it doesn't make sense. People cannot... Uh, cope with hundreds of messages of changes here on the on one screen. You see, I think, 50, 40 different data points here. It's not possible. So you want to reduce that to something like, say, 50 uh, CAN frames per second, or peak, if you're in an expert mode, it may be 300. So, and what I'll show you in my talk is now how you can handle that, 
how can you so how uh, you receive or how uh, an HMI receives the can frames filters out the irrelevant ones and you may, can make sure that you still have a very smooth moving HMI sending can frames that's the other way around setting properties on uh, on the ECU is telling a ECU hey the knife chopping off the leaves of your sugar beet should rotate faster um, that's what you do with the properties. And then obviously you do not want to write, uh, what is it, 350 signals, you have 1800 properties, some 2500 errors, that you will all translate that into structures or little objects. You don't want to hand code that, you want to generate the code. Before we come into these things, I'll start with some basic concepts about uh, controller area networks so that you have a bit of an idea of what they are. They're actually pretty similar to CAN and then the architecture of CAN middleware and then we, we do the practical thing, things here. So, uh, CAN bus architecture. So this is actually the, uh, um, very much the CAN bus architecture of the sugar beet harvester. Um, you have two CAN buses, CAN0 and CAN1, blue and brownish. And well, some uh, is used like the engine or the body or the joystick, they are connected to CAN0. Some others doing the, actually the digging of the, of the beads or the chopping of the leaves, they are on, uh, on CAN1. And the terminal is on both CAN buses because uh, the driver needs to see information from from all ECUs, so from both CAN buses, and um, bless you, and uh, also manipulate the properties on all the C ECUs. So uh, another um, device that is typically on both or all CAN buses is a telematics box, for example. You see that all the ECUs have a unique ID. It's a called a source address. So the terminal is 28 hex, the engine is always zero hex, and that's defined in some standard, which I will cover as well. The communication uh, principle on CAN buses is simple. It's like queued signals and slots. So if an uh, ECU sends a message, it writes it on the CAN bus, and every participant will see it. And they can decide, eh, I'm not interested in this. I ignore this message, or I act upon that. So that is exactly signals and slots in Qt, or, well, if you uh, design pattern, in design patterns, it's called publish and subscribe. Typical bus concept. Um, can frames are always, uh, or, or always consist of a frame ID and the payload. The payload is just some bytes, and there are actually two types of CAN frames. You have the extended format and the base format. And the only difference between the two is the, uh, the length of the frame ID. With the extended format, you have 29 bits. With the other, you have 11 bits. And as you can see there, so what we are, or I am interested in mostly is is the extended frame format. That is typically what you see out in the, in the wild, especially with uh, farming machinery, with construction machinery, and so on. So that's what I will be looking at. Um, the payload length is always less than or equal to eight bytes, unless you use flexible data rate devices, which are pretty rare out there. So it's just, the top one for us here in the talk. So how do you create a QCAN bus frame? Uh, a QCAN bus frame needs a frame ID and a payload. So you set up a frame ID, it's just a 29-bit number. Um, the payload is just a qubyte array up to eight bytes. And then you pass that to the constructor and you have a CAN frame, very easy. QCAN bus frame has accessor functions to access the frame ID, to access the payload, and you get the respective stuff back. You can check whether your frame is valid. Maybe your frame ID was 30 bits. Then Qt will complain. 
Uh, you can check whether it's an extended frame format. Yes, it is. That's what we are interested in. And no, it is not flexible data rate. It has um, a map. It has um, um, two string methods, so you can pretty print uh, a Q canvas frames. And there is a second method, actually, uh, a second constructor. You pass in a type, like invalid type or re a rec remote request frame or something like that, and then you get a, a can canvas frame. So pretty simple class, but well, you, you will use it a lot. So now the big question is, what is the meaning of this frame here? Actually, it can mean everything, unless someone gives, uh, defines what it's supposed to mean. This initially, say, when uh, Ken Boss came out, every manufacturer gave it its own meaning. So they had a lot of fun, so when, say, a tractor was supposed to work together with, with a cedar or a fertilizer, some trailer or a mower, it never worked together, obviously, and it was a communication nightmare. So what you do in such situations is pretty clear, you standardize. And this is where the J1939 uh, standard comes in. It gives meaning to can frames. So I can actually tell you just by, by looking at this, and I have looked at probably at too many can frames, um, that comes from the engine, it's zero, zero. Uh, it is the F004, yeah, that is the ECC1 message, and it tells you quite a bit about the engine speed and, and the engine torque. So it's defined, and then you have the payload, well, as we know, this is this, uh, this frame, then we can also decipher or decode uh, the, the payload. Um, and so suddenly tractors and their implements can work together. They understand each other. So a John Deere tractor can talk to a Case New Holland uh, Cedar or so. Uh, you can just switch motors in a, in, a, uh, in a vehicle, so from MAN to Volvo or vice versa. And the J1939 uh, standard defines something like 1,500 uh, frames. That's why I knew what that is and it defines also the source addresses of standard devices. So a terminal is always 2.8 hex, an engine is always uh, zero, body is 2.1, and so on. So and it's, it's used actually here, so on the field, obviously, harvesters, tractors, trucks, snow plows, uh, construction machinery, so excavators, crane, they all use J1939 or something on top of that. Um, good. How does a J1939 broadcast frame look? Um, the important thing for us is, starting from the right, every J1939 frame has a source address. So we always knew, know which ECU sent it. Then it has the next information, it, it has a so-called parameter group number. The parameter group number defines how the payload looks, so how we have to decode the payload. Like in the previous example, we know, okay, there will be some bytes will be the engine speed, the engine torque, or the ac some higher precision engine torque, uh, and so, uh, so on. So it defines the uh, payload. And then you have always a priority, which is typically uh, six for, for normal frames. Uh, broadcast frames are like huge signals, and easy you can just broadcast it to the world 100 times per second or two times per second, and peep, uh, other ECUs can ignore it or not. So on the right-hand side, you see the encoding and decoding process. So say uh, the body wants to send or broadcast a message, and it's uh, this message, so the PGN or parameter group number defines that you have here 
actually three axial angles you want to transmit and with a priority of six. You encode this by concatenating these three things while the priority is shifted two bits to the left. And that's a parameter group number, the source address. And the values of the parameters uh, are written in little endian format. That's important. It's always little endian format. And then the Q canvas frame would simply look like that. So the frame ID and the payload. So there's the second type of uh, chain 1939 frames, peer-to-peer -peer frames. They are slightly different. What is still the same is the source address. It still has a source address, so we know where it comes from, and that will be important. We also know it's a peer-to-peer -peer frame, so we have to define to which ECU it should go. Some of you may now think, well, uh, it's publish and subscribe. Uh, so actually, why do we need a destination address? Okay, it's for setting, say, properties in, in remote ECUs, and the ECUs which are not addressed here should normally ignore it. The terminal is, is curious in nature, so it will listen and sniff to everything because it has to display things and allow the user to change properties in other ECUs. Then you have a shortened parameter group number and you have a priority again. So the peer-to-peer -peer frame is not like a queued property, but you use it to set properties in remote ECUs. And that's where the properties come in. And the, well, the encoding and decoding is pretty similar. So you put together priority, PGN, destination, source address into the frame ID. And then the, say, if it's a right property request, then the first byte would say it's a right property request. So it's an ID for uh, what, you are, uh, what you want to do with it. So a read property request could be one. That's actually can be defined by each manufacturer and how, how that structure looks. Um, and it is defined by everyone. Uh, then you have an ID. You have to say which property should be changed. And then you have a value. And again, you write this in little engine format into your can frame, into the payload. So, yeah, and actually here the payload is uh, defined or determined by the first byte of the payload. Good. If you have questions, you feel free to ask, especially if it's understanding. <laughs> between this and this frame? Ah, yeah, that's, that's here. So this is the, the PF uh, byte here, which says, so if it's uh, in this range between zero and uh, 240 excluded, then it's a peer-to-peer -peer frame and if uh, it's from 240 to 255, then it's a, a broadcast frame. I have to do it manually. There is no PPU. No, there is no. For chain 19, good question. For chain 1939 frames, there is no uh, QT equivalent. So you have to define that uh, yourself. And actually, there is source code accompanying my talk. And there you will find it. Uh, yes, there are, uh, as I said, 100 or so are defined by the standard. So the terminal is always 2.8, uh, engine is always 0, body is always 2.1, and so on. And then you can define your own. So the actually the uh, ones, the uh, source uh, addresses for the uh, front stuff of the harvester, they were proprietary. Not in uh, neither, uh, so not by default, neither in CAN bus nor in J1939, but there may be some add-ons which, which do encryption. But I don't, actually I don't think, 
because as soon as you have access to the CAN bus of a car, where you just plug in yourself a uh, cable, then you can basically switch off the brake. That's how they got it cheap off the road, so it was demonstrated. <laughs> Um, that's uh, well, ODB is something like a gateway, so it only gives you certain CAN messages, and you certainly cannot uh, change any properties or so. Le uh, uh, harvesters and tractors, you can do everything. You can actually ruin the motor. You better have a good insurance if you're working on that. One more, then I go on. Good. Mm -hmm. That could be on the physical layer. I'm not quite sure, but I think that there is. Thank you. Okay. That's also done on the on the physical layer. So that is nothing uh, you have to deal with if you're working uh, in the cute layer or above. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, architecture of the CAN middleware, actually. Um, you can, by the way, you can get all the slides from my uh, web page later. Um, so, Okay, the, the central uh, component is a CAN bus router. And why, why is that thing called a CAN bus router? So if, say, the steering uh, ECU sends a message over the CAN bus, then it will arrive here at the terminal system. That's another ECU. And it arrives in the Linux kernel. There's a socket can Linux uh, kernel module. And the QCAN bus device translates uh, Linux can message into a Q CAN bus frame. And whenever the Q CAN bus device sees a frame, it will notify send a Q signal and say, hey, there are some frames. Um, the Q CAN bus router will pick them up and will route them to uh, what I call an ECU proxy. So there's a, for every relevant ECU, you will have a proxy or while well, the cloud people call it a digital twin, well, it's a digital twin, or it's a proxy, it's a stand-in for the real thing. And uh, the proxies get J1939 frames, so there's some conversion uh, being done. And then they send the plain number of, say, the engine talk to the uh, QML HMI. And it's only in the, you should only, in the models of your HMI, you should translate that into, uh, into a floating point number with a given unit. <laughs> Don't do it earlier, you wa waste uh, a lot of bandwidth here and you get a lot of trouble with floating point numbers. I've done it twice wrong, I won't ever do it wrong again. Um, yeah, that's life. Responsibilities of the CAN bus router. Well, the main one is obviously routing the messages from, uh, from an ECU to its proxy and then to the uh, uh, HMI. Um, next one, reduce the number of frame, frames seen by the HMI. That's, as you remember, is, the, uh, is one of the main tasks here. You don't want 1,000 or more messages hitting your HMI. It will freeze. It will simply freeze. And it doesn't make sense, by the way. Avoid write buffer overflows. We'll see where that's a problem. Think of a firmware update where you write 256 8-byte frames one after the other on the, on the CAN bus, and the CAN bus will simply say, write buffer overflow. Good, but there are ways, and you have to handle error frames and a couple of more things. So how do you connect to the CAN bus? First, 
Well, this is on the left is my typical setup, hardware setup. So I'm a software guy, so I always have a bit of trouble to figure it out. But there is a terminal, so that's the real thing, touch screen. Uh, um, can cable is dangling out of it. Then you hook up, uh, and that's something you have to buy. You hook it up with a terminated two-wire serial cable, so some resistor in it, so that the CAN frames can't escape. And that goes then in a CAN to USB uh, adapter and goes to uh, ECU simulator on my PC. So that's my typical setup. You can reverse roles, you can have both on the PC or so, that's all possible. Uh, system D service, well, that's, uh, the, that's the usual incantations. Uh, you, you have an IP uh, and a command to configure your, um, uh, your CAN network interface. It's, CAN is actually a handled like a LAN network interface, a wireless LAN network interface, which is nice, which makes things easy. So you set up your CAN bus here with a very typical rate of 250,000 bits per second, and then you bring it up. And the interesting thing is, you, you, I, I wasn't able to do it in, in one command. You can only set the bit rate with the IP command and the write buffer length with the if config command. If, if you can figure it out how to do it in one, let me know. I'm happy to uh, borrow that. So, Let's move one layer up. We are now in the uh, QML application. Uh, we define uh, a QCanvas device in the Canvas router header. Uh, we then, uh, in the constructor, we create a device through this QCanvas singleton. And the create device function needs a plugin name, which is on Linux, it's SocketCAN, and it needs the, the name of the network interface, which is CAN0. Um, there are other plugins uh, coming with Qt CAN bus, like say PCAN, which you would typically use on Windows, or you even have a virtual CAN, which is very nice. You can run all your ECUs, you can simulate all of them on your PC, and you have a CAN connection between them. So you don't need uh, five devices or so and uh, 100 cables. Um, and then finally, you just have to connect the device. And then you would typically already see uh, CAN messages coming in and or you can write them. In the constructor, well, if, you're, if the device is still connected, you call disconnect device and then it stops talking to the CAN. Good. How do we receive CAN frames? Now it's getting interesting. Um, okay, no water. Uh, good. So the CAN bus device, whenever the Q CAN bus device sees uh, CAN frames, which can come from different uh, ECUs, it will send uh, emit a signal and say, "Hey guys, I have some and girls, I have some uh, uh, frames for you." And then the, um, well, the CAN bus router is connected to the frames received signal with an on frames received slot. And in this slot, uh, the CAN bus router will first read all the frames from the, in the end, from the socket CAN buffer. And this read all frames means the next time you call it, you see the next batch of frames. So they are gone, they are really taken out of the buffer. And then uh, next step is um, you put uh, the CAN frames, that's the Q canvas frames, you put them into a cache. And you actually sort them, so the cache is a map from source addresses uh, to the uh, arrived CAN frames. And this is actually also when in queuing the frames, this is also the point where you convert Q canvas frames into J1939 frames. Because otherwise you wouldn't know that they come from this or that uh, ECU. 
And then finally, the last line, in the last line, the canvas router emits a signal of its own and says, well, I have received CAN frames from these three or five or two uh, ECUs. Good. Next step, um, the proxy. So it's here, it's a body proxy actually, and it's base class, the ECU proxy base. I shouldn't point, I should use this. Um, so there's a slot again. And the first thing is to check uh, for the body proxy, am I interested in that? Is that a frame for me or is that for, for someone else? So if, if uh, the body proxy is not interested, it returns immediately. Otherwise, it iterates over all the J1939 frames uh, and calls this receive broadcast frame function, which actually decodes the frame. And so it takes out, basically it takes out the whole uh, entry from our cache for the body uh, ECU. And the final step is, uh, that's now the decoding. So we still have, uh, well, we know the frame ID and we can, uh, that's decoded easily into priority, pr uh, parameter group number, and the source address and so on. So that's easy going, but we still don't know how to interpret uh, the payload. And this is now uh, this thing. So you check whether the parameter group number is, well, here, the parameter group number for the axle tilt message. And you have an if then else or a switch over a couple of more messages. So, well, we have seen 350. Well, the body proxy has, say, 50 or so. And you check whether which mesh you identify the message. And then you can actually decode it. So you call a decode function. And in the end, you have a structure. Payload is a structure with these three angles. So it's the three, the, the angles of the three axles. And the next thing is, how do we do the decoding in a halfway intelligent way and easy way? Uh, so we see that, so the, we, we got the Q canvas frame with the payload, a J1939 frame. And we know from the, uh, uh, from the uh, definition of the J, uh, J frames that, well, the first 16 bit are the angle, first angle, the next 16 bits are the second angle, the uh, third 16 bits are the third angle. You can also have, say, two bits for this, three bits for that, seven for that, 13 for that. So it need not be powers of two. But you have bit, a uh, certain bit width and a certain starting positions for the, uh, uh, for the uh, parameters in your payload. So, and the, well, the best matching uh, uh, data structure in C++ or C is a bit field. So you can actually write in a bit field, you can write exactly, so the Excel one angle is the first 16 bits, then it's the second 16 bits and so on. And you fill it up to 64 bits. So that's a pretty straightforward and direct mapping from a byte array to some structured, to a, a, a structured bit field. Um, the function, and then, uh, well, how does the conversion work in the end? It's the Q from little endian function, which takes uh, the payload and converts it into this payload object we have over there. So that's actually not in the public API, unfortunately, it's in the private API, but it's in the header anyway. One word of caution, bit fields are tricky beasts. They are compiler, the order in the bit fields can be compiler or is compiler dependent. So you better write a lot of tests to make sure that uh, you don't get the second angle first and then the third angle and the first angle. But, uh, well, I've done it a couple of times by now. So far, I haven't uh, messed things up.
So it's if you stick with one compiler or you check that say GCC is doing it exactly in this order, I don't, uh, so Clang I think as well because I use it and didn't see any uh, messes, so pretty good, but check other compilers. So now it's, well at this point, we still see all the uh, can frames and what we want to do is we want to reduce the number of frames we forward to our HMI. So that's one of the main responsibilities of the CAN bus router. And the thing to do it, so when we, when we in queue frames in the cache, we immediately tell, uh, uh, send the, uh, the signal and say, okay, here are some more frames. So that's the thing we don't do anymore, but instead we set the queue timer and say we only send an update or uh, this frames received signal every 100 to 250 milliseconds. And then it slows things down. Then you can play a couple of more tricks actually. So look at what you receive. So this is seven can messages you receive say in 100 milliseconds. And you see so uh, the same letter means it's the same message. So you obviously can receive, uh, well, you receive the message A uh, twice, and A2 has the newer values. So you can throw away A1. You don't care anymore. Your sampling time is a bit slower, so you only care about the newest values there in your HMI. Same goes for B1 and B2. And yeah, that brings you down to, so you have two blue ones instead of four and say, well, you are interested in C, so you let it pass the filter and E and D you are not interested in for whatever reasons it might be. E might be only uh, uh, relevant in, uh, in expert mode or so, and not in normal mode. Or D might be from a diagnostic message which you're currently or which where the GUI is not interested in. So you, you retrie, reduce the number of frames uh, considerably just by slowing down the sampling rate and you send a lot less uh, messages to the HMI. So this is actually the, the main thing you should do in, uh, in your HMI. That's which, uh, which turns something uh, stuttering or occasionally freezing into something that uh, that works smoothly. There is a low level. Uh, there are low level filters in uh, in socket can. So and the nice thing about them is actually you can prevent can frames from even entering uh, your your Linux system and going into your application. It's, you, you tell the, with these filters, with these raw, raw filters, you tell the socket can module um, to block uh, certain frames or it's done in a positive way so you tell the socket can module, okay, uh, let these frames through and uh, all the others are blocked, which is a cool feature. Your QML application will never see these uh, the frames which are blocked on that level. Your system isn't loaded with them. So uh, the uh, the magic key is the raw filter key configuration parameter in your QCanvas device. And uh, yeah, here you see an example how you do that for uh, for source addresses. So if you only want to let the uh, messages from the body controller, that's 2-1 hex source address. If you only want to let them pass, then you, uh, well, you set up your filter, which is always a frame ID and a filter mask. And this, the one FFFF just says, oh, I don't care about these uh, first uh, 21 bits. And then I only care about the source address, which should be 21 and you uh, uh, end that with this FF, so you will get this. And then you compare every frame coming in, you take the frame ID, end that with the filter mask, and if it's the same that you get from the fil filter ring end, uh, then you let it pass. 
So that's also pretty powerful because frames do not even enter your system. Um, yo, sending can frames. Um, so the other way around, it's a bit, bit simpler actually. So imagine you want to set a property in a remote ECU to a certain value. Uh, so the property ID is PID and the value is well. And on uh, your QML, HMI, your model typically will have a function like that, write property. Uh, write property just creates uh, some frame object. It's derived from a J1939 frame and writes this frame object to, uh, or calls the write frame function of the canvas router. Uh, it's a peer-to-peer -peer message, so we want to send it to the body ECU, that's 21. The uh, sender is the terminal, which is 28 hex, and then you have to pass in the property ID and the value. Good. Going down one level, uh, the CAN bus router just calls the right frame function on the device, on the QCAN bus device. And as every chain 1939 frame is a QCAN bus frame, it's derived from it, uh, you can just pass it in the standard right frame function of QCAN bus device. And then it's put on the, uh, on the CAN bus. Hopefully it reaches the ECU. And then the ECU decodes it. And we know how to do that. It's just receiving a CAN frame, so we could use what we have done before to decode it. And it's setting the value of this property, say, in EEPROM. Uh, EEPROMs are pretty much, still pretty much in use on ECUs, uh, not necessarily flash. And then the ECU will send a response and t uh, tell the terminal, yeah, I received, uh, I received the value so-and-so for that property. So the terminal can check again whether that's the uh, right property and the right value. And finally, the ECU has to decode the right property response in the same way we have done it before. So that's all in place. A little bit about uh, the, now it's an encoding. So we actually have here the right property request has this bit field structure in there. And you have a value, you have, a, uh, no, sorry, a, a property ID and value. And this is, well, the, uh, it is derived from chain 1993. 1939 frame, why is that so difficult? Okay, from the J frame. And it has to convert this structure, this payload bit field into, in the end, into a byte array. And well, by now it's pretty, uh, yeah, it's uh, hopefully pretty obvious how you do it. To get this payload into a byte array, you just use this Q to little endian function provided by Qt, by the way, it's in the Qt Endian header. Okay, three minutes. Uh, okay, encoding payloads, buffer overflow. Um, well, just imagine you write uh, 25 frames in one go and your write buffer length is actually 10, which is the default on Linux systems. So it's not 64, it's 10. Uh, so you write these 25 frames and what you will see is, oh, a couple of no buffer space available uh, error messages, which comes from the uh, yeah, socket can buffer. It's an overflow. Good, what it did here is, well, it wrote 25 requests, uh, one after the other, and uh, hope for 25 responses and got some errors. What you want to do is actually, you want to write uh, one message, then you wait, uh, wait for a response, then you can write the next one because you know, okay, there can't be a buffer overflow. That's the idea. Well, you have some situations like the firmware update where it just write uh, 250 frames without a response in between. Uh, 
and then you don't have the uh, response, so you have to do it a bit different. The interesting thing is what many uh, ECU developers will tell you, I just throw in some, uh, some, uh, some weights, so wait for 20 milliseconds, that should do. Uh, yeah, you can do it, uh, but if the bus load is a bit higher, it will still fail because then your buffer will still overflow. You will have a traffic jam there. And obviously it wastes bandwidth. And the firmware update over CAN takes a couple of minutes and you don't want it to take, say, uh, 20 minutes instead of three. So what do you do? Your savior here is uh, that you receive your own frames. So, and there is, again, a magic key, a configuration parameter called receive own key, uh, which lets you see or lets the terminal see the, the frames it has written on the, uh, on the CAN bus. Normally, it will ignore them because, hey, I knew what I wrote on the CAN bus. Why, why shall I read it? But in this situation, it's clever to read that, to actually see the frame. And what you now do is, you, well, first of all, you, you cache the frames. You cannot write them directly to your uh, canvas, as we have seen before. So you have to cache them. And whenever you, uh, you write on the canvas a uh, request, then you wait until you see your own message. And then you can write the next request. Wait for it to come, and then you can write the next, and so on. And this is actually, this adapts dynamically to the bus load and, um, well, makes the best use of your bandwidth. Good. Um, um, can we take them in, uh, in two or three minutes? It's not, not much, so then we uh, have a, a Q&A anyway. So let me just finish then. Obviously, you do not want to hand code all the little structures, all the little objects uh, you have seen by now, all the write property request object, the axle tilt object, and so on. There are um, 5,000 of them in this harvester. You want to generate them. The nice thing is that um, the, uh, the, uh, uh, that the, yeah, the, the ECU developers typically, they define the CAN messages with, say, the help of the, uh, some CAN tools from Vector or Peak, or I don't get money for that advertisement, but that's the common tools there. And so these files, these definition files, this is a Vector simple file, by the way, um, the uh, uh, define each message, each, si each signal here. So that's our famous signal by now, has a CAN frame ID. And you see actually they define the angles pretty much as position zero and then 16 bits, position 16, another 16 bits, 32. So it's pretty much a one-to-one -one mapping to your bit field. That's actually how I, at some point, I came up with a bit, uh, using a bit field, so I did it a bit more complicated initially. And the uh, frame ID also maps over there. So, and the other thing is the properties of the ECUs are defined typically in manufacturer-specific formats. So e each ECU manufacturer has their own uh, format. Uh, one is DBM, uh, database, whatever thingy, uh, from a well-known manufacturer, and they define the properties of the ECUs. So you have the important thing here is you have an ID, and that's mapped to this uh, field in your bit field, and you know here that's the name of the ECU which is another numbering than the uh, source addresses, so that maps to 21. So they, they make your life a, bit, a little bit tricky. But in the end, you can also generate these structures here from these uh, property definition fields or parameter definition fields. And yeah, that's it. So 
I'm actually an independent consultant, so I do that for money and have done two harvesters, uh, uh, the Krone forage harvester and the Ropa uh, sugar beet harvester you see here. Have worked on a couple of infotainment systems. E-bikes have CAN buses by now. Scales have uh, CAN buses. So CAN bus is pretty much used uh, everywhere. And there's the code link, by the way. Thanks a lot. So, time uh, for questions. Ah, with Mike this time. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. First question is um, using SocketCan. Um, so, I'm using SocketCan for impl impl implementing. Uh, communication with Canvas. What mm -hmm. are the major benefits of using Qt Can beside the um, portability with uh, PCAN or Windows Linux systems? Um, it's a nice abstraction layer, so you don't have to write. Or you probably uh, like like me on my first project, I implemented something like Qt Canvas myself. So I had to. Well, you have to create a socket, bind to it, then you have to read the. Uh, low-level frames in the Linux uh, can structure, can frame structure, and so on. So you have to do all that, and that's implemented underneath Q, uh, in QCanvas device. That's what you save. And they test it for you. You don't have to do the testing. And yeah, that's the advantage. And then, well, that's only the starting point for everything which comes above it, which is quite a bit. <laughs> Yeah. <clears throat> um, talking about testing, um, is it possible to instantiate two uh, Qt um, CAN bus devices from one application? So in the scenario using um, virtual CAN with uh, an application under test, like unit mm -hmm. test or integration test, and a test driver which is also connected to the virtual CAN bus. Do they uh, uh, run on With, the same can? On the same can? Then yes. probably same no, if it's a different, if you just use a different name for the network interface, uh, then it should work. But, so, But then I can't communicate between the uh, unit, uh, testing unit and my driver. Well, for, uh, yeah. Uh, well, I've, I've actually written a, a unit test mock CAN bus device, which you also find down there, uh, where you uh, do not actually write on a CAN bus, but it behaves like one. So it's okay. just a mock up. That's mm -hmm. probably a way you could imagine. But with, uh, well, with uh, virtual CAN, it must be in two different processes. I'm pretty okay. sure that I, I got a bloody nose when trying it in one. <laughs> okay, um, thank you. I think back there is a question. Yeah, the question is uh, regarding uh, this proxy. Mm -hmm. uh, is it an object actually that you can, uh, uh, that filters uh, those frames by passing an argument with uh, the specific ID that we care about? Or is it something that uh, we need to do uh, ourselves? For, uh, for uh, yeah, good question. For the for the raw filter, it's actually there is a, you would find. I hope it's pushed already. Otherwise, it's just on my development PC. There you will find a function registering exactly that uh, uh, raw filter. Actually, this is something the constructor of your proxy should do, because you want to make sure that every ECU with a proxy, so every ECU proxy registered a source filter. If just one or two of them does it, then you block the uh, messages from all the others. So the proxy does uh, the filtering? Yeah. And uh, regarding It, it the sets the filter. So the raw filter it sets, that is much further down, and then you have on a higher level you can write your own functions, which is basically uh, a Boolean uh, a function, so a Boolean condition. And you would pass, there is nothing in there at the moment, uh, 
but uh, you would write some condition object and uh, or lambda function and pass that to the proxy. And another question is regarding uh, the buffer that uh, uh, gets all the frames. Is it yeah. something that we need to control or um, the API uh, does that automatically? It, it is some, uh, it is a, a custom object uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is a member of the CAN bus router. So it's something I've written. You, the caching isn't done by, by Qt, which well, uh, it's a bit debatable whether uh, whether they could do it or not. Probably not. It's too customized. But yeah, w would be doable. Okay. So it's actually for the uh, actually the right frame looks exactly the same whether you use the buffering uh, for the uh, of the right buffer or not. It it looks the same from the client code. It's inside the CAN bus router, and the same way you could put it inside Q CAN bus device, but it's probably not a good idea. Okay, well, one we have one quick, one quick question. Time for that. Questions are always quick, the answers are long. <laughs> Hello? I just didn't uh, get it if uh, I understand it correctly. Uh, you used the uh, raw can protocol and you used the uh, uh, J39, uh, <laughs> that yeah. one, uh, to format the, the can messages. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you considered using the ESO TP protocol and uh, like a higher protocol that would. Uh, enable you to use larger messages? Uh, no, I, I didn't consider that. And um, uh, I haven't seen ICTP used in, uh, say, in uh, agricultural machines at all. So, and, well, in, in other application fields, say, uh, in industrial automation, you will see can open more often which is the equivalent to the J1939. So things will be a bit different how the frames are interpreted, but still you will need some middleware like here. So the ideas uh, still apply. Good. All right, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. much.